Welcome to the Lessons of Real Estate show. I'm your host, Anthony Pinto, and I'm excited to have our special guest here today. Our guest is David Pear. David is an active duty Marine and joined the Marine Corps in August of 2018. Since that time, he has traveled to and lived in many unique places around the world, including a combat tour in Afghanistan. David got started in real estate investing in 2015 when he house-sacked a duplex using an FHA loan and lived in it for a while while uh, getting married to his beautiful wife, Kimberly and uh, receiving orders to Hawaii. Uh, while stationed in Hawaii, David bought a 10-unit apartment in Missouri, and he has continued success with uh, real estate investing in that state as well. Uh, through these experiences, uh, from military, or yeah, correction, from military to millionaire was born with the goal of uh, teaching service members and veterans how to build wealth through real estate investing, entrepreneurship, and personal finance. Through his podcast with the same name, he has helped many of his listeners increase their savings gaps, purchase real estate, and increase your chances of achieving financial freedom. David, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, brother. Yeah, so uh, it's a little late for this, but thank you for your service and happy Veterans Day. <laughs> I guess I mean, it's not that late. Same week. Still counts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Thanks for yours as well. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, so it sounds like um, you know, you, you've you been in doing real estate for a little bit, but you've been doing an active duty. So you know, tell us a little bit about you know how you went from you know being active duty and and being in the military and being a uh, in the Marine Corps to getting to into real estate and how that's how that transition has worked for you so far. Yeah, I uh, in 2015, a friend of mine handed me the book Rich Dad Poor Dad, and I kind of jokingly was like, "Yeah, hey, I don't read." Like, sorry, and um, I really didn't want to read the book though, so I was not really joking. Yeah. Uh, and then he like, I kid you not, this guy pulls out of his pocket or backpack. I don't remember. He like literally in the conversation pulls out, like puts the book away and pulls out a disc. And he's like, well, here it is on CD. And I know you drive a lot as a recruiter. So now you got no excuse. And in my head, I'm like, damn it. You got me. Um, <laughs> like, um, and dude, I finished that book in like two, three days. I don't know. I mean, it was like, boom, done, hooked onto the rental property investing book by Brandon Turner, onto the another bigger pockets books, onto this, onto that, onto Google. And within three months I bought a duplex. Um, the timing was just kind of good there. My apartment was uh, like the lease was coming up and I was like, well, I either renew my lease or I figure this out. And I just kind of made the jump. Uh, Missouri prices are cheap though. So like really wasn't that much of a heartache to try to justify doing. And, uh, it worked out. Like I realized this is doable and just kind of kept going with it. Solid. So, so you were engaged to your now wife at that time, right? I was. So uh, what um, were her thoughts? What were her thoughts on getting into real estate at that time? She owned a house already. Um, okay. So she, I mean, she was all about it. She hadn't bought that thing as an investment, but it was an investment. So she, I always joke about this because she, she bought this thing. It's like right across the street from her dad's, like right across the drive, the like private drive. And like some guy had OD'd in it. Like he didn't die, but I mean, he OD'd um, pretty hardcore. It was like a vegetable or something. I don't know. Um, and my wife had just moved into, she was staying, I guess she, I don't know. I don't remember what had gone on in her life, but she had just moved out of a house and moved and was living in her parents of like a little in-law suite for the time being. And so it's like in their barn. Um, they're cattle farmers, like, you know, country hillbilly stuff. Um, and I love it. But uh, she was like, she tells me she was literally like yelling at the realtor, like whenever they show the house, like someone died in that house. Like, um, anyway, so she got this thing for a steal. I don't remember the numbers, um, but a steal. And her dad had built houses for 30 years. He's a cattle farmer now, but basically her, her dad and her brother-in-law like rebuilt this thing, renovated it, added a garage, did this, did that, whatever. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it did well enough that I've been able to pull a pretty solid HELOC off it. Um, so I don't know that she ever intended on that being an investment, but it cash flows now and it was bought, right? So it works. Yeah, no, that it sounds like it, it turned out for the best for you on, on that front. Uh, that was almost a complete opposite of what my wife said when uh, when I got off my boat, um, you know, end of last year and told her that we we're gonna move out of our 18 square foot house and move into an apartment in Portsmouth. So, um, yeah, so good that she took that well, and I guess that she had a background already in real estate, so that had helped her case with, uh, you know, trying to house hack it at the duplex. So, um, so yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. Like, um, so you know, three month time frame is is very quick to you know go from zero to sixty. Um, and did you know, did you partner with anyone in particular? Did you you know, how, how did you figure out that you wanted to do you know smaller multifamily, you know, and and specifically house hack? Uh, I guess it would have probably just been the 
book on rental property investing from bigger pockets was just they talked about the house hack in it and I was like that sounds like a great idea and I was running some basic numbers in my I don't know that I knew how to run numbers at the time but I was just running numbers in my head and I've always been kind of analytical and I realized I'm paying 550 a month for this apartment and it's a two-bed one bath and most of the duplexes in in this town the, they're not that expensive like the mortgage is going to be under seven hundred dollars so why not like I can risk an extra 150 bucks to buy a duplex and like it, even if the other side's only rented like four months a year, I'll break even. Um, and it just kind of made sense. So I was like, yeah, screw it. Why not? Let's see what happens. Um, and then, you know, you'll say, you saw in there that I used the FHA loan because my lender talked me out of the VA loan because, quote, didn't want to waste it on a small property, which is dumb. Interesting. Yeah. I, if I'd known what I know now, I would have not spent $10,000 in closing costs and down payment and PMI and everything else over the last four years. And it'd probably make me about 60 bucks a month, 80 bucks a month more without that PMI, but still been profitable, still been a good investment. Um, yeah. I mean, we've got equity in it now, so it's, it's not a bad play. Sounds like it, uh, it's worked out in the end. Um, so for our investor or our listeners who don't, um, you know, know, know much about the military or the real estate side for, you know, the benefits that we, that we have, you talked a little bit about what a VA loan is and uh, what makes it so unique. Yeah. The VA loan is, uh, I mean, base, the basic premise is that the government has decided to back or the department of veteran affairs has decided to back 25% of the down payment. So where you would normally be out of, 20, 25% down, the government's basically guaranteeing that they'll pay it if you don't uh, to the bank. So the bank just kind of waves it. So you can go zero down on, uh, you know, right now there's a limit, but in like six weeks, that limit disappears and we'll get to see what happens with that. That'll be kind of interesting to see what happens when it goes to a debt to income loan where you can borrow a lot more than you've been able to. Um, there's just some different options with the VA loan that a lot of loans don't have um like there's a renovation set up to it which the fha has the 203k but you still gotta pay three and a half to five percent down whereas the va loan you can still do it for zero down so it's just a great option for veterans to get into real estate without having to spend a whole bunch of money now you're over leveraging you're 100 percent financed you know there's there are risks associated with using the va loan but if you house hack or something where you're essentially like not having a mortgage payment it's really not that bad an option. Yeah, it's uh, you know I I talk to a lot of military guys who um, are are trying to get into real estate investing and they don't they don't fully understand that they can use their VA loan for that um, and to to house hack specifically and that and that's how my wife and I got started in our quad as well and you know I think it's it's a great opportunity for you know a E4 or E5 who is making a ton of BAH to, you know, instead of applying that to an, a rental property and essentially getting no return on that, you know, use that towards purchasing a, you know, duplex, a triplex, a quad, you know, and live in one of the units and rent out the rest of them. And with the ultimate goal that all of those uh, other renters can essentially pay for your mortgage for you. And if it's, you know, if you're getting a good enough deal, even make you money on the back end of it, right? You can get cash flow off of that. Um, so I think that's yeah, I think that's a great option for a lot of military people. And you and even the FHA loan is, is great if you can own or occupy a property and, and get into real estate investing that way as well. Um, for a lot of people who may not have the experience or the money to go out and buy, you know, a, a, a quad or a, a large commercial property right off the bat. Um, I think that's a, a great option for a lot of people. I agree. Um, so, uh, so okay. So you started with the duplex, uh, and you eventually got into this ten unit. So, um, was, um, are you? Do you still own that ten unit? I do. I just refinanced last month. Okay. So tell us about how you went from the the duplex to this ten unit, while still in Hawaii, even. Yeah. So I was actually mailing for duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes. I was hitting up, uh, pulled the list from list source, and I was shooting out letters to people who had equity and small multifamilies. And this guy called me and was like, well, I don't have a duplex for sale, but I have a 10 unit. I'm like, hmm. All right, let's talk. And uh, but luck would have it. I happened to be home. I think it was for like a week and a half for Christmas. Um, so I was actually able to look at, I think, two of the units. Like I got to walk the exterior. There were like two vacant units, but I didn't get to look at the other eight. Um, that was enough for me to see kind of what it was all about, you know, confirm that it was like a C class neighborhood. It wasn't anything fancy. Um, but we talked numbers and I got them down to like, it was like 225. So cheap Missouri prices. Yeah. And, 
I got my property manager to go through and my contractor when we did the uh, closing and they, you know, or when, they, when we did the inspection, they walked through and they knew what needed to be done. So they did a little bit of interior upgrades here and there. And uh, my contractor did external stuff. And that was, I mean, it's about all she wrote. So you, so you reached out to this guy directly then? Yeah. So how did you go about finding these uh, essentially off market properties uh, to be able to talk to the owners directly? I was using listsource.com and you can essentially buy a list of names that's been pulled from tax records. And so uh, you can put, I mean, it's incredible the kind of criteria, like you can basically search by anything you would ever want. You can search by equity, you can search by purchase date, you can search by uh, size, square footage, you can do zip code, you can literally like draw a box around a neighborhood and check, you know, whatever. I mean, you can do all kinds of stuff on that website. Um, but the more, the more criteria you put, the more you're paying per, per name on the list. Uh, they pull it all from tax data and they they sell it and then I basically just hand wrote letters which I don't recommend. Um, I recommend typing or you know printing letters. Uh, I I only handwrite now if it's like a house that I'm like super super interested or super in potentially buying. Um, it's just not worth. I mean maybe you get five or ten percent more responses when you hand jam, but holy crap, like a hundred letters will take you like a whole week to write. No thanks. Right. So, um, so did, did, then you, did you switch to doing type letters from there? And you know, once you kind of got that success and you, and you built upon, you know, this going directly to the owners, did you see a lot more success with, uh, with those, with those, uh, typed up letters or did you kind of switch into more cold calling or did you just stick with written, written, uh, uh I don't know that I'd say I probably saw a little bit less success with typed letters. So the trick with typed letters for one is you still kind of use like a blue, blue print and it kind of like, not like a normal like Calibri or New Times Roman, but like something that looks kind of handwritten or I've even heard of people uh, like handwrite a letter in blue ink, except for the address and you know, whatever else that needs to be interchanged and then scan that and print that and then they can just handwrite it in with a similar pen. Um, So you want to make it look handwritten. Uh, but the really, even if you did do like New Times Roman, the most important piece is at least the signature, blue ink or whatever. Maybe you handwrite the email, the phone number, but on the envelope itself, you always, always, always handwrite the name and address of the person because your your open rate is like double if you do that. Um, I mean, we all think about how much mail you get that you just throw away without even opening. Um, but if it's handwritten, I guarantee you almost always open that. Um, I do, at least. Uh but you know, I, I've done a lot of that. I've had some success with that. I've also just had a lot of success with like networking and wholesalers. Um, but I mean, I've, I've gotten some definite negotiations off the letters. I've kind of slowed down on that um, just because a lot of my capital has been kind of tied up lately. So I've not been marketing as much as I probably should because I know I can still buy seller finance, but I've been kind of pulling the reins back a little bit on my, my runaway cart when it comes to like over leveraging deal after deal after deal and trying to build up a little bit more reserves for, for going forward. Um, but I, I like the, I like direct mail. I cold calls fun, but I mean, I, if someone's gonna be an asshole to me, I'd rather them have to like go out of their way to call me to be an asshole as opposed to me just getting a hold of them. And like, there's way more people that are going to be rude to you if you're cold calling. If you send a letter, they'll probably just throw it out. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm interested in getting into cold calling soon too, so I kind of want to pick your brand and see uh, what your thoughts are on that. Um, I, I tell you, I did that for three years as a recruiter for the Marine Corps, and as if you're good at it, and I can give you some some small pointers on like just calls in general when you talk to sales or whatever. Um, like number one, if you're listening to this, like put a mirror in front of your face and smile while you're doing it because people can hear whether you're smiling or not. Like I know that sounds dumb, but it will come across totally different if you put a mirror in front of your face and force yourself to smile than if you just like, oh, what was me? Nobody's answering my phone calls. Um, so there's little tips and tricks like that to cold calling. Um, I just, I'm just not a huge, I don't dislike cold calling and it's very effective. I just like, I think I'm just too lazy to cold call is what it boils down to. Like, I just kind of like, eh, I don't want to deal with all the voicemails and like pointless shenanigans when I can just send out a hundred letters and see if anyone gets back to me. <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, no, that's fair. I mean, it's, I've, I've uh, kind of realized as I'm doing a lot of these menial tasks that, you know, with content creation and, and inputting business expenses and all these different things that I can have someone else do um, that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of realizing what my time is worth to me and, you know, what I can do to get the most return on my time. Because at the end of the day, like, you know, this is, 
you know, I, I love real estate investing and I love talking to people about it and I love buying properties, but you know, I'm, I'm still active duty, right? So sure. it's, it's still my side hustle at the end of the day. So we only have a limited, limited amount of time to work on it. Right? And, and it's the same with you, you know, you, you know, you kind of do it on the weekends or at the end of the day. Um, and so, you know, trying to maximize that time that you have from three to 10 is, is vital. Um, so no, I definitely agree with trying to maximize your time to get you the most return on that. I think is is super important, you know, whether, whether you're this, your W2 is in the military or, or not, or, you know, even if you decide to do real estate full time, you know, trying to maximize your 24 hours a day is, uh, I think it's vital to, you know, being successful in this. So you don't just, you know, it doesn't feel like you're just spinning your wheels and, and going from there. So, um, so uh, going back to the, uh, the, the 10 unit here. So, um, so you moved to Hawaii and then you found this 10 unit. Yep. Okay, so did you already have your team built out on the ground, like um, the property manager, your contractors? You already had all that, you know, set in stone before you started finding these properties. Well, not set in stone, but I, I, the property manager was solid, the realtor was solid, uh, everything else I've just got to piece together whenever I need it. Like I have a couple friends that are contractors, so they're usually my first people. Um, I think this is the flip I'm doing right now is probably the first time I've not used a contractor that I was friends with to do all my work. Okay. Um, which usually works out for me. They, like I get discounts or they'll have like extra material laying around. They'll say, well, I can do it with this and not charge you for materials. I'm like, great. Um, and then as far as like lenders and uh, all that other stuff, like eh, just kind of case by case. Like I have a couple people that I like, but I just kind of wait till I have a deal and then <laughs> call around, shop around. So really for me, it's just the, the property manager and the realtor are probably the two biggest ones that have helped me out, mainly the property manager. And she's been a lifesaver for the last three and a half years perfect perfect all right yeah because i was i was going to say for you know for individuals that are trying to invest out of their own backyard you know remote investing you know whether that's across the country or you know a few hours away um you know i i think it's vital to building your team boots on the ground or that's your you know someone that you're going to partner with in the area a property manager a contractor you know broker someone that you know you, you could be on the ground to go look at properties for you and kind of give you a sense of what's going on with that property because um, at the end of the day, we, we can do all of this work with going to Google Maps and street viewing and looking at all the financials, right? But, you know, without actually putting eyes on at a picture that may or may not be three or five years old, you know, you, you, that could totally make or break that, that property. And uh, I had a, another guy I was talking to about a month ago who was a, a LP on a deal or was, was potentially an LP uh, with a few other syndicators. And, um, you know, he, he was, you know, sounded great this property sounded great all the financials look great but he went to go tour the property and it turns out that uh, i think it was like eight different buildings one of the buildings was completely gutted by fire and that the the gps hadn't told him anything about it right so you know it just goes to show you that go, going there and being in the in the property and seeing what's going on with the property it's it's absolutely vital you know whether you're a gp or an lp uh, whether you're, you know, whether you're the active investor on that side, or you're going to be investing with active investors and putting your money into a property, I think putting eyes on a property is is vital, especially if you don't, if you don't, haven't worked with those individuals before and you don't know what their investing strategy is like, right? Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's absolutely key. So uh, we'll kind of uh, transition here a little bit. So you can you continue investing from Hawaii, uh, continue looking in, in Missouri, I'm guessing. Yeah, mainly. I mean, open to whatever, but that's yeah, mainly, mainly where I hunt. Okay, so, um, so, uh, you know, after that ten unit, or you, it may include your ten unit. Can you tell us about what your best investment property was, what your worst one was, and what you learned from both? Yeah, so I'd say the ten was probably my du my best. Uh, the du I mean, the duplex has been great and like no issues, and it's cash flowed from like day one. It's been wonderful, like not a headache at all. But it's still like, you know, 300 bucks a month and you know, like it's good. It's like hundred percent cash on crash cash for the last four or five years, but it's not like big enough for me to say best deal. So that 10 unit as crazy as that thing's been, cause that thing's been a wild ride. I mean, I've had, um, someone took out the roof of the U-Haul, uh, and that was like a six month insurance claim. I have re most recently I've had someone die in it, like rot there for like three weeks before anyone realized he was dead and had to bring in like, industrial hygienists and environmental cleaners and like cost like five thousand dollars to pull all the carpet out and clean the place it's been real Gosh. real fun yeah and then we have to store his stuff for like 90 days because no one's claimed like no one i don't know it's weird like i guess he like nobody was left it's kind of sad but like 
my property managers got like this guy's stuff for like the next 90 days before we like auction it off or burn it, I guess. I don't know. Cause if no one claims it, like, mm -hmm. um, so that one's, it's been a wild ride with that property, but I only put 10,900 down and I refinanced 18 months later and pulled 14,000 out, dropped my payment $200 a month and had 62,000 in equity. So pretty solid win considering that I'd already regained all my money through passive, through cash flow. So that was like, I don't know, like I have well over a hundred percent return, probably like 200% return on what I originally put down on that property. And I've got, you know, five or six times what I put down as a, as equity. So it's, that's probably been the best experience as far as just knowing like, Oh yeah. Hey, look, we made some money on this property and it didn't kill us. So Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. So, wow. I didn't realize that you you had all those, I don't want to really call them issues. I would call them experiences. You know? Yeah. They're tuition. tuition. Um, yeah, there you go. So then to answer your question, my worst, uh, man, I'm trying, my flip is really trying to rival. Uh, it's, it's going so bad right now. Um, but I think we finally made progress. I think we finally fixed everything with the city and it's been a mess. Like just one thing after the next with my little flip, I'm trying to do to regain capital from my worst. Um, my worst, which like, like I, I told you before, I can't go super into details on, but we bought a 40 unit. Me and one other person partnered up, bought a 40 unit for 2.795 mil um, through a lease option. And it just didn't work out. Uh, long story short, um, the seller, I don't want to say he misrepresented or fraud or like, I don't want to like point fingers here because we're still in litigation. So I, you know, I mean, I could very well be just like in my own head and totally wrong. Um, but there were some very black and white things in the contract from the seller that, that just were not completed and they caused tenants to vacate and cash flow to drop and expenses to skyrocket and it wasn't manageable and there was money owed for things that weren't done in the contract that also wasn't done and it was just kind of a i don't know one big misunderstanding i guess but uh anyway so four months into that deal we uh sent a notice and said we're terminating this contract to buy the lease um, I want my money back because this doesn't feel like what I paid for at all. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, if we may very well get told to pound sand in court cause that's the non-refundable lease, whatever, but there were things in that contract that were supposed to be done that weren't. So it's kind of a, who knows? Um, so that was my worst, but at the same time, like aside from the money we put down on it, I haven't lost anything other than like legal fees, which I'll probably get back once we hopefully win or I will get back if we win. Um, and I've learned a ton. Like for one, I've learned a ton about the legal system. Uh, for two, I've learned a lot about like not due diligence for the property, but due diligence for the people. Um, man, it's incredible what like a couple sour apples in a group will do. Um, so um, well, I, one of the things I should have done on that was I should have brought my property manager in from the beginning. Um, but I met their property manager. She seemed wonderful. She put on this great face. I met the maintenance guy. He seemed wonderful. He lived on site, like dream come true. And she, I mean, both me and my partner were like, wow, she sounds amazing. Well, we got off the phone with her. Um, and then I fired her within the first month because uh, it was just a different story once I was the boss. Um, and not because I would like to think I'm not too difficult to work with uh, because I'm, I was in Hawaii. Like how hands-on micromanagey can I be from Hawaii? If I'm that bad, ignore my email. Um, so it was just like all of a sudden tenants who had been listed as paying rent didn't even live in the building. But when I walked through the property, there was someone there and they were said they were paying. It was just a weird situation. Um, and I think the property manager was – and I, I don't know, she wasn't solid. So there were just some weird things that went on with that. And um, the maintenance guy was okay, but then he wouldn't work if she wasn't working. So he left. So I ended up bringing my whole team in, my property manager. She hired someone. Um, that guy sucked. So we fired him. She hired a second one. That guy was amazing. Um, so all of that to say, I'll never buy a property again without bringing my property manager in. Even if my property manager is not going to take over, if she had walked the property with me with that property manager, she would have saved me because she would have been able to tell me afterwards, like, yeah, that property manager is full of crap. Don't, you know, don't, don't use that property manager. Oh, okay, cool. You want to work on it? Um, 
but she was both more affordable and better. She's a lifesaver. So definitely bring in my team in. Um, and then the other thing would just be write everything down, like, like get everything in writing. Um, and I know that sounds super basic, but we had everything. Like the contract is thorough. Everything's in writing, except there were a few negotiations that happened on the phone, like two or three, but there were, there were some decent sized negotiations, which is why they happen on the phone, vice email or, or text, because like, you just don't want to have those kinds of conversations on the phone or on text message. Um, and what I should have done and what I would tell everyone to do from now on is like the moment you get off one of those phone calls while it's still fresh in everybody's head, send an email and say, you know, I need you to reply that you agree to this. Here's everything we discuss. This is what we agreed to. Please reply. And then make sure they reply and get it in there that like, this is what we agreed to. He's acknowledging that he agrees. Um, because there's just, a few like nothing like world ending but a few like he said she said points that just neither one of us can argue so if i was wrong i guess i win um and if he was wrong i guess he wins but like neither one of us can even bring it up because it's just something that i said first something that he said and it, it just kind of muddies the water for stuff so that's probably the, the one thing so those are probably the two things that i would say off my worst deal that should apply to every deal ever is like I really, really, really vet all the people, probably more so than the building, because um, the inspection report's going to be good, but that doesn't matter if the people running the building don't do what they're supposed to do, and then get everything in writing. So if you negotiate with someone on something, great, Like, but the hand handshake deal, as much as I would love to think that handshakes are still good, they're not. Don't even, sorry. I don't care how great the person is. He's, he's not great. Handshake deal's not good enough. Do something in writing. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I, I hadn't ha heard uh, you know the phrase like that with doing due diligence on the people as well as the property. You know, I, we always talk about you know running the numbers on property and analyzing the deal, and the deal is everything. But you know, a, you know, a property manager can totally break a property, right? It could totally go from being you know, total cash cow to just running straight into the ground. Um, yeah. You know, just and, if, and they might do it, and you wouldn't even know because they might just know that they're doing it on accident and know how to make it look like they're not. So like, I'm not saying that's what happened. I think that might be part of it, but um, like, it's not hard for the person who's involved to make it look better if they're your source for the records. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. And, and I'm not saying that everyone, you know, your property managers see that are running properties that you're looking at are, you know, in criminal in any, any way, but um, you know, it's, there's a whole breadth of experience out there. Right. And um, you know, it, and just in property managers in a particular area, you could have someone who specializes in 10 units or 20 units and someone who specializes in 100 units, right? And if you don't gauge that right off the bat, you know, they could, you know, be wasting their time if they only deal with 150 units and you're giving them a 10 or vice versa. They may be completely underwater and drowning and when they've never dealt with 100 units before and they only dealt with smaller multifamily, right? Um, so, so on that note, so what type of due diligence do you do from, from now when you're um, I mean, you obviously have a property manager set up already. So how, how did you vet her to make sure that she was the correct person to work with? Oh, I have, um, I have a whole list now of like 20 questions that I have. I have a little PDF on my website that I hand out. Um, or if you remind me, I'll, I'll send it to you or link to it. Um, okay. we link in the show notes. But yeah, but I, uh, yeah, so I kind of compiled this list of like, I, I boiled it down to 20 questions, but I compiled every list I could find on the internet of property manager questions to ask when interviewing someone and then pick the ones that were the best. And I literally took this piece of paper with me and read every one of them off while I was interviewing property managers, which actually saved me from one that I was like the one that I was thinking of using had the, I mean, they had everything. They had the cute secretary and the free coffee and the, do you want a soda and the tour and the, all the hardworking people in suits who look really professional and the nice building. Um, and the property manager I went with was like working out of the back room of an apartment complex. And it was just like her and her daughter. Um, and they did not have most of the other stuff. Um, and they were so much better, so much better, because I just wondered, like, man, the people who have all this flashy stuff, perhaps it's because of fees. So the things that I would say main look out, mainly look out for is, for one, it, do not ever work with a property manager if the contract says anything other than X percentage of gross collected rents, because if it says just gross rent or just if it says X percentage of whatever, um, 
and it's not specified in there that that's of collected rent, there are property managers that will charge you even if the room is vacant. And that sucks because then like, where's their motivation to fill your vacancy if they're getting paid anyway? So absolutely no. Um, but the other thing is like, if the property manager wants the full months, like full first month's rent, I know that's kind of a common thing in some markets. Like, get bent, sorry. Because if I'm gonna pay a property manager the first like full month's rent for them to find someone to move in, like, I might as well just leave the place vacant for six weeks and do it myself. And I guarantee I can find a tenant in a month and not pay that stupid fee and it would be better off and I might as well self-manage. Um, so the property manager I found has very, very, very few fees. So I tell everyone, take the contract home. Like no matter how amazing the property manager sounds, take their contract home and read it. Go through everything, especially like the fees and payments and, and how to exit the contract because you want to make sure you can get out of it if, you, if something goes bad. Um, but especially all the fees and actually go through and if you don't understand a word because it's legalese, use Google. It's amazing. It'll give you the answers to what a word means. You can even type in the sentence and it'll tell you what it means. Um, but I, I mean, I've been able to work my way through legal contracts just fine by Googling a few words I didn't know what they were and whatever. Um, and verify the fees because there are hidden fees in a lot of these contracts. And I ended up like that guy was like 10%, which, or he was like 8%, 9%. I don't know. It wasn't bad, but there was like first full month's rent, hidden fee here, hidden fee there, whatever. I've got someone who's like 7%, no hidden fees. And like they get, they, uh, the only other stuff I pay is like a little bit of office stuff. It's like, I kid you know, it's like three or $4 a month for property. Um, so it's pretty affordable. And then, and that's kind of a newer thing uh, just because they're growing. And then, um, oh, I pay for the advertising and marketing, but I would be paying for that anyway. So, and that's cheap. That's like a hundred bucks maybe every time I turn over. So my turnover costs are really just the actual property turnover and she's very quick. Um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of it. There's like 20 questions in there. Some of them I don't really touch on. They don't really matter, but most of them are really good to ask. But no matter what, take that contract home with you and actually read through it and make sure you know what it says. I know it's long, I know it sucks, but so does having a crappy property manager. It's probably worse. In fact, I know it is. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. It sounds like you've been through, through the ringer in terms of property managers. So um, yeah, well, uh, once I get that from you, we'll link it into the uh, show notes so everyone can take a look at that because you know, being, being prepared to talk to property managers so you don't get swindled by them, I think is, is super important, especially if you're the only interaction you're having is over the phone because you're doing it remotely. Yeah, you know, I think having a set of questions and you know having a control, you know, that you can kind of judge how people will react to certain questions and and that can really kind of give you a sense of how they're going to act. Um, you know, when they're under duress or some situation happens where they have to kind of think on their feet or um, you know some, something along those lines. So yeah, I think that's super important. Yeah, we'll definitely include that in the show notes. So uh, we're all getting uh, we're getting uh, close to a uh, time on uh, here. So uh, you want to get into the snapshot round? Sure. All right, here we go. All right, David, what is the number one thing you need as a new investor to get started? Books. Learn everything you can. Nothing matters without that. Like, you could be worth $10 million. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to screw something up. Or you could be worth nothing and have no money. But if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to lend it to the wrong person. So just learn. Okay, knowledge, awesome. Um, okay, next question. Uh, what is one nugget of investing knowledge you want to give us? Man, one nugget. I usually say like learn, network, and take action, right? But I kind of already said learn. But like networking and taking action, that's what it's all about. But I'm going to just say watch the expenses. People get so wrapped around, wrapped around the wheel on how they can potentially improve rents and increase income and this, that, and the other. But I'll tell you, the expenses is what makes or breaks a property. So if you can cut $200 a month in expenses, that's just as valuable as adding $200 a month in income, except that when your property goes vacant, the expenses stay the same. So it's actually more valuable, but. Yeah, that's good. That's a good uh, thought. Um, yeah, with expenses, especially when you're talking commercial properties, you know, you're lowering your expenses and now your NOI is increasing overall and now your property value is increasing, right? And it may be, you directly correlate to cash flow. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, you know, um, and on the other side of that is, is you know, increasing rents or increasing income. You can also lower expenses to get the same kind of result. So, yeah. all right, perfect. Um, and then what is uh, your dream? Hmm. To be able to control my time. That's the long and short of it. I got like a whole vision board, but that's basically what it boils down to. Oh, your time. Perfect. Yeah. 
work on uh, what I want, when I want, and where I want. Okay. So uh, is that um, – do you have a set kind of uh, freedom number that you want to get to? Oh, I've got all kinds of numbers. I got a whole – since this is video, I got a whole, like, board of, like, numbers oh, and wow. goals. And, um, but, so I have it written down right here. It's $5,000 a month through real estate. But, uh, but then it's also – I mean, it's also measured by – podcast downloads and how many days I get to travel internationally and I want to do speaking. I want to host a conference. I mean, there's all kinds of other stuff, but uh, if I can get 5,000 a month through real estate, then that's it for me in Missouri. Even once I hit that, I'll still invest, but I want to be able to have 5,000 a month and then roll the rest into whatever. But realistically, I don't even need the $5,000 a month. Um, like I was doing the math. My wife wants to keep working. So if I get out of the military and go back to Missouri, like I can just be freaking, she can be sugar mama and I can be a bum. I'll be the trophy dad. Yeah. You so, you know, I mean, I got to work on the trophy part, but. <laughs> well, you got the uh, mustache down. So uh, I think go. you're well on your way. <laughs> yeah. 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 We just got to bring that. I mean, it's, it's coming back in style. So everybody who rocks one now, you're welcome. All right. Well, I, I'll forgive you since it's November. So I won't hold it out against you too much. <laughs> Well, uh, David, I appreciate you coming on today. Uh, if people want to reach out to you, where can they uh, learn more about you or contact you? Yeah, from military to millionaire dot com, um, or really, if you type in from military to millionaire, like Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, I'll pop up, or the Military Millionaire Podcast. Perfect, perfect, and we'll link that into the uh, show notes as well. Well, David, again, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show, um, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to have you back on and hear more about you know what ends up happening with that forty unit because uh, you know it's. Legal action is not something that a lot of people, you know, really want to talk about or have experience in. And I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very important lesson that you could teach from that. So we'll definitely have to, you know, hear what happens from that and have you back on here. Yeah, sure. hopefully it'll be finished within the next year. <laughs> it's only been a year, so. Well, I, I believe in you. I'm sure it'll work itself out in the end. It will. All right, take care, man. Thanks, brother. Have a good one. You too.